Thanks, Whitney, and uh, thank you all for coming out. This is our inaugural use of this space. So we just came through about two years of um, retrofitting uh, this historic building on uh, Brattle Street, and um, you're the first to use it, so um, welcome. And so uh, to begin, uh, because we're a land policy institute, I'd like to make a land acknowledgement. Uh, we are on the unceded ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to indigenous peoples everywhere, recognize their wisdom and resilience, and honor this land which remains sacred and still unceded. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us uh, here. And um, you know, as you know, there's probably few more contentious issues than kind of the dominion over land. And it didn't start 400 years ago when we decided to kind of push aside Native Americans here. It's been going on for millennia and it's gonna continue. Uh, but you know, more often than not, control over land ends up kind of redounding to power. And whether that power is military, as in the Ukraine, or political, legal, or economic, it's usually exerted um, over land, and very often in the kind of the disputes over land, power wins. So for us, the, the Lincoln Institute of Land policy, we think it's really kind of useful to kind of um, really open up people's thinking to land policy and to understand kind of the fundamental importance of land and the dominion over land, the control of land, the use of land for multiple purposes. So our mission is really to find ways to use land, land use planning, extracting value from land, finding ways uh, to um, more effectively uh, steward uh, land for conservation or for endangered species um, as um, uh, our mission. Our mission isn't to just get land policy right. Our mission is to get other things right using land policy, and that's an important factor. But, you know, very often those two words, land policy, kind of ring hollow in most people's ears because they don't even know what it means, right? And we say, oh, well, we're the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. A lot of people say, oh, you do zoning, right? And so uh, for us, uh, it's really, really helpful to kind of ground people in what land policy is, and it's actually fairly simple but really hard, right? The simple thing is that it's, it's how we negotiate between the individual claims over land and the need to use it for collective purposes. And so, you know, in the, in the, the war uh, over collective ownership of land that the Native Americans had to the British common law, we know who won that, right? And now we're still in this war over finding ways to better use land for collective purposes than to necessarily protect land for individual uses. But navigating kind of the path between property rights and community needs is what land policy is. And that's why it fills such a vast space. It's everything from zoning to uh, the property tax, how we extract land value, to uh, conservation easements, how we actually find ways to conserve land in perpetuity for conservation purposes or to protect habitat for endangered species. There's um, a vast number of things that, that land policy kind of touches on. But all of it kind of is just uh, a foundation. It's, it's the underpinning of lots of other things that kind of that we find expression in, in our political, legal, and economic systems. So, you know, we're here today because uh, as a species, we, we face an existential crisis probably unlike any that we've ever kind of experienced on this planet. And that addressing that existential crisis, the climate crisis, or whatever you want to call it, the climate emergency. I don't like to just call it climate change anymore because that doesn't really signify direction, right? And, the, and as you know, the direction is decidedly bad, right, uh, in terms of uh, the climate crisis. But um, when we look at it from the point of view of land policy, we think that the transformation of land use that's going to have to happen in the next 30 to 50 years is unrivaled in the history of humanity. It's probably going to be bigger than um, the enclosure movement that started the Industrial Revolution, uh, the Industrial Revolution that kind of you know, added infrastructure across the world, uh, the Great Depression where we kind of doubled down on infrastructure, or the Marshall Plan where we try to rebuild um, the, the world after we you know, destroyed it with a, our second world war in one century, right? 
all of those things are huge, and, the, and, and you can see the indelible kind of remnants of all of those land use practices, decisions, and all that, even today. But what we need to do over the next 30 or 50 years will make all that pale in comparison. And so uh, knowing just how contested the space is for land um, is really important for us to kind of understand and grapple with those things. So why do we bring you here, right? We bring you here because we need to kind of um, elevate in some ways kind of the understanding of the, of the important role that land uh, plays and will play in our ability to address this existential crisis. And if we get it wrong, we're just going to we're going to leave a planet that's very, very different uh, for whomever is left to uh, exist on it than than, it, than there is today. And um, and the big question is, are we prepared to and can we navigate between um, the really, really powerful claims, uh, private claims over dominion over land um, in exchange for the collective needs to use land differently to get to better kind of global outcomes? And it, I mean, it, 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 everything kind of hangs in the balance. We, it, we, we're not sure that, that's, that we know how this is all going to turn out. And that's why we need your help and everybody else's help to kind of um, elevate the, this topic. So, you know, we've put together a, um, a program for a couple of days. And as you know, the intent of the program, right, is to give you new angles to tell kind of the climate story. And so, the angles we have, of course, are all rooted in our mission, but we think that you're going to find that there's lots to kind of think about and, and lots of new ways to kind of look at the climate crisis. And hopefully we'll be able to um, uh, come out of this with um, um, a lot of ammunition for storytelling and for really kind of changing uh, perceptions out there in the world, because that's one of the big jobs that uh, journalists play. And uh, it's one of the, the big jobs that we don't do very well at the Lincoln Institute, so we need your voices. We need your pens, right? Um, so what, so then let's just talk a little bit about the program so we can kind of understand kind of the logic of what we've laid out for you, because it's, um, I think it's going to be quite engaging and interesting, and hopefully um, you'll push us some, too, in the next couple of days. So we're going to start with, uh, with kind of something that's really near and dear to my, my heart, which is this a panel on land uh, in competition, right? And uh, land and competition, no one needs to kind of explain what that means because there's all sorts of competing claims over land. But one of the things that, um, uh, one of the reasons that this is up there is because I've been obsessed for probably the last year in trying to kind of reconcile something that really, really bothers me. And, and, and Bruce Babb and I were just talking about this a little bit in the, in the hallway. So, you know, whenever we actually try to motivate people to take action on like big things like a climate crisis, we tell a lot of gloom and doom tales, right, to kind of uh, get people kind of worried, you know, anxious, motivated to actually take action, right? Um, and then we do lots of analyses to support these, this empirical analysis about, oh, let's just look at a new map of what the world will look like if the sea levels rise by five feet. And we can do that very quickly, right? Uh, or we can ask, um, where are and who are the people that are going to have to move as a result of rising sea levels? or you know, increased uh, uh, droughts, or wildfires, or any of these other things. But one of the things that's troubled me the most is that, because uh, I've been tracking this more in the housing space than in the land space, is the fact that every one of those analyses, every one of those calls to action that we, we bring to try to build political will to do something, is actually fodder for private equity to think about where they invest next. And where they invest next is going to be in the land, that, because climate change cuts in two directions, right? Some land actually will improve in its value as a result of climate change when we start growing you know, oranges in Canada, right? Um, and, and others will, will diminish in value. But the trade in private equity is an in information. And so in private equity, and one of the things, the reason I've been bothered about it in the, in the housing space is if, if, you, if you don't know, uh, in the last year, about almost a third of all private single-family transactions in the housing market went to private equity who are converting single-family owner-occupied housing to rental housing because the economics are right for that, right? And all of a sudden, everybody is concerned because what are they doing? They're raising, continuing to raise housing costs, which have become unsustainable for a, a major part of the population, right? Well, imagine this, right? The analysis we do about where land is going to go up in value draws all this uh, private equity, which is, of course, an outgrowth of global 
wealth inequality and lots of people sitting on piles of liquidity that need yield, right? It's just going to draw that money there and it's going to raise the price. And then when we need that land to do what? I don't know. Put a solar collector, put a, um, put a, a, a wind generation, put, uh, or, or, or find ways to sequester carbon in that land by managing it differently, right? It just becomes that much more expensive. And we have done nothing, right, in the last, I don't know, 200 years to get ahead of speculative action in land markets that make everything we want to do harder. So that's the motivation for that panel. And I want you to really think about that because right now we don't even know uh, and we haven't been doing a very good job of tracking the flows of private equity and it's only starting. But we do have remedies. And uh, if you look at the, the last landlines, I, I, I wrote a little bit about this. Uh, in places like Taiwan, where, where, which they have very active land policy and they use land policy as a national framework to help them become uh, you know, a, a thriving global economy, one of the Asian tigers in the 1980s and 90s, they use a land value increment tax to tax away the, um, the benefits that come to uh, folks who speculate nakedly in land markets and make high profits. Right now, the, the land value increment tax in Taiwan is between 40 and 60% of the upside of land value increases. At one time, it was 90% in Taiwan when they were actually investing in themselves to become the Asian tiger that they were in the 1990s. So land value increment tax is a very easy thing to do, right? It's just like capital gains tax. But of course, try to introduce that in any country in the world right now. And let's see what, what kind of, what, how we'll see kind of the power over land exerted. Uh, it will be an interesting exercise or an experiment. But that's land and competition. We, and, and the thing is that we usually think of land as single use, but I think what we're gonna start having to think about is, um, you know, <laughs> multitasking of land, you know, and being one of, the few, one of the people in the room who is horrible at multitasking. Getting, understanding how we're going to get land to multitask is going to be kind of a, a, an issue going forward. But we're going to need to be really, really kind of creative and expansive. And we're going to have to think about whether or not we want to give um, all the benefits of, um, of what we're proposing to do away to private equity who do nothing to earn it, right? And that's a, that's a legitimate question. But as you, as you probably know, right now, the, the, the forces of capital are probably a little bit stronger than the forces of... Uh, Democracy, law, right? Okay. So um, the, next, uh, the next panel, land, water, and agriculture, this is about, uh, about land use, a specific land use, because, of course, um, you know, at least for the time being and going off into the, into the future, we're going to need to feed ourselves still. And clearly, one of the things that we've learned and, and through the work of the Babbitt Center, and we have Bruce uh, Babbitt here, um, We've, uh, we've, we've begun to kind of unpack the nexus between land and water. And we understand things you know, that are really fundamental and, and, and almost uh, you know, self-evident that land without water is basically valueless, right? Because you can't do very much on it. Well, other people might argue, well, there's other things you can do on it. But let's just say for, the, for many purposes, land without water becomes a, um, a, real, um, a real problem. And we've been now having to deal with increasingly uncertain and increasingly variable um, donations of water to land from our climate that have uh, you know, created all sorts of problems with uh, drought, wildfires, and all the other kinds of negative ramifications of the climate crisis. And so we're going to hear about kind of how we kind of understand the, uh, how to manage both the, the need for land and water and the need for land for other purposes, right? Uh, land and conservation. So as you know, that's a, a next panel. Land and conservation is about these very, very ambitious and bold kind of efforts to find ways to aggressively uh, conserve land. And uh, the United States is now committed to the 30 by 30 goals uh, through the America the Beautiful plan of protecting 30% of the country's land and water resources by 2030. And that's just a, a, a harbinger to half Earth where the goal is to protect half of the water and land resources of the planet by 2050. And conserving it means conserving it not so that it doesn't get used, but it means conserving it so that it doesn't get destroyed and harmed, like deforestation in the Amazon or in Indonesia. It means that it's, it's managed for good purpose, and some of the management is to leave it alone or to leave it for you know, native species to use, but 
um, it means that we have to really think about both the methods of doing that and how we're going to kind of pay for it, how we're going to find ways to get people to agree. And right now, on a planetary basis, depending on how you count, we're probably somewhere between 15 and 18 percent of uh, the land and water area of the planet that has been protected. So we're going to have to double that in the next, what, eight years, and we're going to have to triple that or more um, in the next uh, 30 years, 28 years. So that's a, that's a big task. But anyway, uh, and we'll hear certainly more about it, but it's certainly something that is um, getting a lot of press, maybe not a lot of action yet. And one of the things we're hoping to do is begin to kind of motivate more action in that space. Uh, land and climate finance, one of the other things that we know is that there's been you know, lots of um, heroic efforts to do things like uh, protect us from climate change, like adding seawalls to Venice, which are going to be obsolete, or maybe they're already obsolete, I don't know. Or, to, you know, to talk about adding a seawall across Boston Harbor, which is a little bit uh, ridiculous. But um, all of the efforts to kind of protect land or even to find ways to, uh, you know, use financial resources to protect land require um, finance that is, um, right now, not easily identifiable as w where is it going to come from, right? All the transformation of land we're going to do, just like uh, all the infrastructure investment we need to do, this is trillions of dollars that we're going to have to find to, to kind of support this. But one of the things we at the Lincoln Institute know is that you can actually derive um, a lot of revenue from land. And land that, is actually been, that has been protected is now more valuable than land that's unprotected. And so the, the owners of the land, or whoever controls that land, should be paying something for that protection. Some of what they should be paying is the increased value of their land that they did nothing to deserve. So we'll hear about land value capture as a mechanism for climate finance in the land space. Land vanishing, of course, is the, uh, the outgrowth of um, sea level rise and all the other kinds of climate, um, whatever, the negative uh, aspects of climate that, that drive people off of land. But one of the things we also know is that the people who are most vulnerable are also the people who have fewest options. And so for us, uh, we, the, the, the basic question is, how do we protect kind of the rights and interests of people who are basically completely disempowered and unable to kind of act on their own behalf if you're going to get displaced from a very poor coastal community uh, in the, the U.S. South or if you're going to get displaced from Bangladesh? Where are you going to go and who's going to facilitate that? And we don't have yet um, a lot of really easy answers to that, but we have a lot of thoughts about that, and you're going to hear about that in our panel. And then, uh, finally, land from above. One of the things that we've, uh, we've done here at the Lincoln Institute is um, <clears throat> we've uh, opened a center on uh, geospatial uh, solutions. And the center on geospatial solutions is actually finding ways to deploy new technology and tools to help guide both our understanding of what's going on, but actually to inform our decision making about what we need to do to intervene in the, in the climate uh, crisis. And you'll hear and you'll see some of the, these new tools that are available to kind of help us to understand. And as you, can under, as you can probably guess, a lot of it comes from space, right? Satellite imagery that we're able to use at very high resolution that can tell us a lot about what's going on in the land. But it's not just what comes from space, it's what comes from space and what comes from our other um, efforts to kind of uh, look at from above what's going on in land and being able to kind of understand it. So those are the, the, the panels we're going to have in between um, some of the, you know, some of the content that's focused on journalism itself and climate journalism and hopefully you'll also benefit from that and I'm sure you'll find that uh, engaging. But, you know, if we're really going to have any chance of restoring the planet to any semblance of the planet that you know, most of us inherited when we were born. Um, we need everyone pulling in the, in the same direction, and we don't have everyone pulling in the same direction now. And a big role that journalism can play is to be able to tell the stories, to kind of change minds, to open people's um, minds to new ideas, and to you know, help us to kind of move along. But it also provides us the ability to hold people accountable, to check facts, to kind of confront ideology that is actually kind of deleterious to our efforts to kind of make things happen. So for us, you are um, super, super important, and we hope that you'll come out of this um, tomorrow afternoon with um, a whole set of ideas and a whole new um, set of angles to kind of 
really understand the climate crisis and our ability to address it a little bit differently than you do right now. But if you already know it, that's even, even better. Then you can kind of, we'll reinforce that knowledge for you, right? So uh, once again, thanks for coming. And now it's my job to introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Brian Golden. He's the director of the Boston Planning and Development Agency. And uh, as you probably know, in terms of, um, uh, of cities that are in peril uh, as a result of the climate crisis, Boston is probably not on the top of the list, but up there, right? And so uh, the, the planning department at, at the city of Boston has a, a big job ahead of it. And hopefully, Brian is going to elucidate us on what Boston's going to do. So uh, thank you very much, and enjoy the next couple of days. And Brian, the stage is yours. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation of the Lincoln um, Institute uh, of Land Policy. Uh, to come and share some of the thoughts uh, we're having at Boston City Hall about the future as it relates to our, you know, precariously perched existence on the edge of Boston Harbor as one of America's uh, oldest major cities. Um, before I get going, it's, it's, a, it's a thrill for me to lay eyes on uh, Governor Babbitt. Uh, this is taking me back many years, but I got out of school here couple blocks from here in 1987, and I immediately began uh, to work in New Hampshire on his presidential race. So for somebody who was aspiring to a political career at that time at, at a rather precocious and early age, um, it was a little awkward because we, of course, had a governor of Massachusetts running for the presidency uh, that very same year. But um, boy, um, I, I learned a lot in 1988 about campaigns, but also about uh, speaking up for what's right, and um, it's, it's a real thrill for me to lay eyes on you, Governor. Thank you. Um, so speaking about, of, of trying to do what's right, uh, you know, when I came to this agency 13 years ago, I was a state legislator, then I was a state utility commissioner uh, for a few years, and I ended up at what was then referred to as the Boston Redevelopment Authority. We've re, re uh, branded, um, uh, but you know, in 13 years ago, people weren't talking a lot about uh, sea level rise. We were talking a lot about carbon. We were talking about climate change. We were talking about greenhouse gas. Uh, sea level rise was certainly a concern, but it was more notional. Um, the science wasn't then what it is today. Uh, we've learned a lot. We've also invested as an agency in learning a lot. Uh, we've, um, we've done research. We've contracted. Um, to understand just what we are up against, because fundamentally what, what we've been confronting for the past decade is the need to define the problem correctly. Like, just how bad is it? And here's the science out there. What do we need to learn more about our own immediate physical environment in Boston? And so that's when we invested. We needed detailed understanding, because if we don't define the problem well, if we don't define the problem accurately, our solutions will ultimately be meaningless and maybe uh, counterproductive. So uh, we started, Mayor Walsh arrives in 2014. I, up until very recently, I used to refer to him, the new mayor arrives. He's no longer the new mayor. We've had three mayors in the past uh, 12 months. Uh, but Mayor Walsh arrives in 2014 after a 21-year tenure of Mayor uh, Tom Menino. And we commission uh, Climate Ready Boston which was sort of a, a generalist approach to um, climate change and its effects on the city. That came a little before our first general city plan. For as sophisticated as I'd like to think we are at the agency and as a city, we had not had a general city plan since 1965. So for a couple of years, we worked on creating a new one. It's Imagine Boston 2030. And, 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 and nested within Imagine Boston 2030, is uh, Climate Ready Boston. Then we started drilling down more specifically nodes along the, 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 the water's edge, all around the harbor. It's a 47-mile coastline. It seems, that seems like a crazy number, but if you actually walk Boston Harbor's Boston edge, you're, you're through the ins and outs of the piers and the wharfs and the streets, you're, you're going to do 47 miles. Um, so we looked very specifically at, uh, at the harbor. Uh, we identified um, 
uh, very specific needs in Charlestown, uh, 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 in a, a very old neighborhood on the water's edge, South Boston, um, East Boston as well, where Logan Airport is. Um, and, and so we took, we went from the general, defining the problem correctly, and then uh, boiling it down to more detailed understanding and more detailed policies and physical interventions that we believed to be necessary. So here's, um, here's a graphic. The one thing I think most important to pay attention to is the, the dark blue is the harbor itself now. The uh, turquoise is um, our future floodplains, both where we're flooding now and where we expect to be flooding in, um, over, the, over the coming decades. We expect a 40-inch sea level rise by 2070. And one of the big problems we had, again, back to defining the problem correctly, we were relying like lots of places on FEMA maps. And the FEMA, the, the FEMA uh, flood insurance maps are present and retrospective. They don't look future. So one big problem we had was we thought the FEMA maps were wrong. Just even, even given what they look at, the limited sort of scope of what they, what they uh, analyze, we thought was wrong given our own observations. In 2014, we challenged the FEMA maps and we were successful. So FEMA redrew the maps incorporating uh, some of the, the concerns that we had and we got a better picture of where the flooding is now. But then we also uh, commissioned a whole lot of staff and consultancies to look future, 2070, where are we? And the picture was extremely menacing and we used that in Imagine Boston 2030 our general city plan to inform decision making about planning and development in 2070 and beyond. But we would not have had that picture about just how menacing it would be if we just relied on the FEMA maps, even the challenged FEMA maps. We needed to understand uh, what this was going to look like decades to come. And here, as you can see, here's downtown Boston. Uh, over here is uh, south Boston. And what, what we refer to now as the seaport, uh, seaport's a creature of the past 20 years, really, and in, in earnest, more the past 10. Uh, it's about uh, 20 million square feet of new development, what used to be, well, entirely landfill. We were filling it up until the 21st century. That, that's how recent a creature the land is, never mind the buildings that are on it. And over here, Orient Heights, that's, uh, th that, is, that is the middle of uh, East Boston. And so we, we've got a lot of work to do to prepare for that um, future flood risk. And, and again, back to the plans, uh, we've identified a host of policies and physical interventions. So I'm just going to talk for a moment about, uh, from a policy standpoint, after we did all this analysis, general down to the specific, uh, we identified some coastal uh, flooding resiliency design guidelines. They actually won an APA award 2019 for excellence and sustainability. Um, really proud of that work, which formed the basis for what came next. We did a zoning overlay district, a coastal flooding um, uh, resilience overlay uh, district, and that became Article 25A of our zoning code, and it puts uh, significant requirements on those who are building along the water's edge or retrofitting, altering their property on, along the water's edge to prepare again for 40 inches of sea level rise by 2070. So we've, we've taken significant steps uh, as it re relates to planning guidelines and zoning um, to prepare uh, for what's coming. And part of that is policy. You will do this, you won't do this. You will do. Um, you, you will either uh, protect your building and vicinity in the vicinity from the risks of flood change, or you will figure out a way to live with it, uh, living with water. But it, you know, it's a it's a sophisticated um, planning and code exercise. But it also these efforts have called for very specific physical interventions now, not just waiting for sort of the development interest um, to be harnessed to deliver some um, sustainable and uh, resiliency wins. Uh, we've got um, uh, a seawall 
over in uh, the Marine Industrial Park in South Boston. We actually are not uh, the planning agency. We are the agency that oversees major real estate development. We also own 20 million square feet of property, most of it old Navy and Army bases that were closed in the 70s and acquired by the Redevelopment Authority. Uh, so we own a lot of property. And right over um, in, the, um, in the Marine Industrial Park near the seaport, uh, jutting out into the harbor, we have got multiple developments underway now, and we're requiring developers of property in our land um, to contribute to a resiliency fund that will be used uh, to implement resiliency measures uh, along the harbor and specifically near our property. In this case, we're acting as owner and actor in the marketplace as well as regulator, but if you're doing business with us in the seaport um, on our land, you're going to be paying uh, to, um, to, uh, to build some resiliency measures. So if we, if we just go, you know, take a look at downtown Boston, you're standing near Quincy Market, Faneuil Hall, Long Wharf Marriott, the aquarium, looking across the harbor to the airport. Uh, you go north, we've got the north end, we've got Charlestown, curls around, sort of northeast, east Boston, you're back to the airport. Go south. Uh, you're, you're heading towards uh, the seaport, you're heading towards South Boston, you're heading uh, to the South End in Dorchester. All of that, all of those areas are characterized by enormous amounts of fill. Uh, the core of downtown Boston, what we refer to as the Shawmut Peninsula, going back to the colonial period, the terra firma there, the original terra firma is only about half the size of downtown Boston. About half of downtown is fill. So that tells you the nature of the challenge. And then we go to these neighborhoods I just mentioned. We've got a big problem. So we've got sea, sea walls in our property. Um, you've got uh, going north of the city a series of parks um, that could be raised uh, as berms. We've got parking lots. We actually own parking lots in the north end, our Little Italy. They could and likely will be part of a resiliency solution to protect the north end uh, long term. You go to uh, Charlestown, one of the, the, the oldest historic neighborhoods in the city. Charlestown has a main drag, Main Street. Main Street is right now. Uh, we finished the planning. Uh, I don't know if we've actually begun the construction over there. Not yet. But uh, the city's going to finance it. I believe the state funding. And in all of these things I'm about to mention, just to overgeneralize, it's usually going to be some city money. It's often going to be some state money. There's going to be some federal money, and very often we're harnessing development. We're doing some value capture, and uh, we are going to require uh, developers to help uh, foot the bill. Surprisingly, again, the cultural shift between 14 years ago and today, there isn't as much screaming on this stuff as there was in the day. I remember in 2013, we started requiring people to do a resiliency checklist in our zoning code. It didn't really have teeth. It just says, tell us what you're going to do. Tell us what you think you can do. But the industry screamed because they kind of knew where this was going. We start with a checklist, and pretty soon you're dealing with a zoning language that's got teeth. And that is actually what came to pass. But the beauty of it is, by the time we started putting teeth into this stuff, uh, the understanding of the need, the understanding of the self-interest that was being addressed, was understood we don't get a lot of people balking at these measures. The policies, all the physical interventions, all the need to figure out ways to pay for it that involve private um, development funding. So we've got, we're raising Main Street to protect a vast swath of the neighborhood of Charlestown. We've already, already got a deployable flood wall over in East Boston. Um, and East Boston is half fill. It's half fill. And it's a, it is a, um, an overwhelmingly uh, low-income population, disproportionately immigrant, a huge um, Latinx population in East Boston. So, you know, the, the, there are serious equity concerns here, too. It's not just protecting the land. It's some of the, the, these floodplains um, are inhabited by some of the most, you know, vulnerable people in the city. So from, an, you know, looking at this from an equity lens, uh, we understand, uh, you know, the, the, the moral imperative involved. We go south of the core, downtown, uh, Fort Point. Fort Point's a channel that comes in, separates what I, what, what I just referred to as the seaport from the core downtown. 
it looks kind of innocuous. It's, it's just a, a, a small channel with a couple of bridges that connect you from South Station, the train station, the Federal Reserve Building, over into uh, the Old Wharf District of, fan, uh, of um, the seaport, and then the newer seaport, which is, uh, again, the creature of probably the past 10 to 20 years. We've got that, that Fort Point creates a whole lot of vulnerability every which way you look. Um, we are in the process. Um, we've done a lot of planning over there. We've got uh, significant physical interventions underway. Martin Richard Park is completed. Martin Richard was a beautiful little boy who was killed in 2013 at, um, in, in the marathon bombing, and we named the park uh, in his memory. It's a beautiful park. It started out as a park. We just wanted a waterfront park. And uh, before we finalized design, there was a big price tag with this, and we went to development, and we started tapping the development in the seaport to fund this. We turned it not just to a park that is, has really universal accessibility. Uh, kids of all physical abilities can find a place, a way to have fun in this park. But we made it um, an extraordinarily resilient feature in helping to prevent um, flood risk to the seaport and, and the surrounding area. Gillette, the headquarters of Gillette is along Fort Point. They've dedicated some land. We're um, getting a $10 million grant from the federal government to help build um, a resiliency measures berms over along the Gillette property. Related Beal and uh, Alexandria Pharmaceuticals, they've got new developments on Fort Point. They're helping finance uh, um, uh, berms as well that will um, build the necessary resiliency in Fort Point. Go a little further south, South Boston, Moakley Park, named for Congressman Joe Moakley. Um, former chair of the rules committee, a real force of nature in, in Boston life. But this is a big park over in South Boston, a, a really significant route um, uh, for, for flood waters. Uh, we're going to spend $210 million, the planning's done uh, on that. $210 million is the current, current budget to raise all of Moakley Park um, and create um, essentially a berm that prevents flooding in South Boston, the South End, a uh, whole lot of. Dorchester, working class, um, and, and lower income um, populations, again, uh, the equity lens. Uh, this is just one of the features where we're tapping development to, to fix. Uh, over here, is this, is this, this is just a, okay, I'm sorry, this is what I just talked about, the Fort Point area. Um, this is Gillette, this is Martins Park, this is related Beale um, Life Science Project and the Alexandria Pharmaceuticals Life Science Project. Simply put, this is what we're doing at Fenway, uh, um, at Fort Point, uh, raising uh, the existing grade. This is Martin Richard Park. Again, um, downtown South Station Federal Reserve Building, just on the other side of the, um, the channel. This is Joe Moakley Park. Um, again, it's an existing park, so we're going to do a whole lot of new recreation features, but uh, a, a lion's share of the cost is raising this vast park uh, significantly um, above uh, uh, above its existing grade. So I just want to say finally, um, and if it's interesting, I can bounce it to Anthony. We uh, yesterday Commonwealth Magazine, which is a public policy uh, magazine here in Boston. If you're not from here, um, ran in. Uh, it's not really an op-ed, but I wrote a piece. Uh, a couple days ago on Boston's the recognition of Boston by the Lee Kuan Yew Prize. So the Lee Kuan Yew World City Prize is given every two years. Uh, we were nominated by Professor Ed Glazer, who's an urban economist here at Harvard, and uh, he focused on Boston's work on uh, resiliency and climate change. A delegation came from Singapore to check it all out, a lot of the things we just talked about they viewed as well as our, our really effective approach to creating affordable housing in an expensive market. And they were supposed to announce winners in 2020. That didn't happen, COVID. So they kicked it off until last week. Um, uh, Vienna won. That's the downside, Vienna. Uh, just wait till next time, Vienna. Um, but they recognized three other cities in the world um, for really significant policies and, and plans and implementation and execution of those for the greater good. And Boston was the only city in the United States uh, mentioned. The other 
two were uh, Lisbon and Antwerp. Uh, but again, focused on our approach to climate change and resiliency. Um, so the, we're really grateful that the Lee Kuan Yew Prize Committee chose to celebrate us and highlight our accomplishments. And, uh, and yesterday I had a piece in Commonwealth Magazine. But uh, thank you. That's, that's for the, the 250 people who do all the heavy lifting at the Boston Planning and Development Agency. And, and to that end, I just want to say uh, Chris Bush, who's a senior planner, waterfront climate change at the agency, is here with me to entertain questions. And Bonnie McGilpin, our communications director, is here as well if anyone has any interest um, in discussing some of the specific policies and, and physical interventions that we've implemented here in Boston. But thanks, Anthony Flint, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Thank you.